Hi, I'm Tommy Rosen. Hi, I'm John Comerford. Uh, we wrote and produced the film Around the Fire. I wrote and produced Around the Fire. <laughs> and you can see we never argued the entire time. <laughs> um, uh, and basically, we're doing the uh, writer-producer commentary uh, now to uh, let you in uh, and let you have an intimate look at what it's been like, uh, good, bad, and ugly. Uh, we're going to tell you some things that I guarantee you most filmmakers won't share about their experience, so we hope you enjoy. Yeah, thanks for coming. Okay, when we finished our script, um, wow, we, we, we thought we had something. After a year, it took us to get it to the point where we actually felt like we could show it to other human beings. That was that much effort to get it to the point where we thought maybe somebody will read this and not get physically sick. <laughs> um, but uh, we passed it on and, and strangely enough, somebody actually liked it. Several people actually liked it and commented on the authentic nature of uh, the material that we were presenting because of course we had lived the material so it was us and it was the script. Yes. So uh, for some reason it was appealing yes. to people. And uh, we um, thought about selling it to, uh, to Hollywood. And we had some inquiries concerning it. And then I took this film course, two day film course, another plug, Dove Simmons Hollywood Film Institute. I don't know if he's still teaching. I don't know if he's still in the business, <laughs> but it was, an assault from beginning to end. It was 16 hours of the most intense um, learning I've ever experienced. And let me tell you, after the first hour of that class, I hated Dub Simmons. <laughs> he was spitting, he was yelling, he was, it was the most rude and vulgar and insane person I'd ever come across. Little did I know that he was essentially trying to flush out the, uh, the non-lunatics, the people who were of sane mind, who wouldn't continue to receive that abuse. Who, of course, would never make a movie. Right, because... You, you'd never be able to make a movie if you weren't insane. I mean, who would do this? Right. Truly. I'm not even kidding. Right. Who would, who would go through this process? Right. So um, he said, actually, in the class, there'll be one, maybe two of you that actually complete a film. Out of how many? Out of a class of maybe 50 or 60. And then he said, out of all my classes that I'm teaching this year, which is like 500 people, maybe one or two of you will actually get your film bought and distributed um, and released. And I thought to myself, of course, immediately when they said that, clearly, I'm one of the people he's talking about. And so I've got to do this. Well, right after I finished the class, and I finished being tormented by this man. I called Tommy and I said. So, so I, get a, I get this phone call from John. We've finished our script. I think we were actually through several uh, drafts, rewrites yeah. at this point. It wasn't done yet. Every, f for the screen, for the new screenwriter, every time you finish a draft, you're positive you're finished. And you're not finished for like another dozen drafts. Like, it, it, it just keeps going on. Oh, well, you keep writing until the film rolls. And that's, that's the process of getting your script from good to great, from good to what it needs to be to actually make a film out of it. But, um, so I get this call from John this day, and John is like, we're making our movie. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? He's like, no, 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 we can do it, we're making our movie. And I'm like, you know, neither one of us at this point had ever really been on a, a set in our life, <laughs> ever. I'd well, never I'd, been on, I mean... I had, some, I'd had some editing experience, and I had actually been to film school. Didn't have a BFA, but I had a BA in film studies. Had you been on a set of a movie at um, that point? Not of a feature-length film, no. <laughs> Only okay. shorts. No. That's, I mean, that's the stories. We had never been on a set of a film, and I've got John, my buddy, and my, my writing partner, this lunatic, having just gotten inspired by Dove Simmons in this school, saying, we're going to make the movie. And he's like, no, no, you don't understand. You have to fly to LA, and you've got to take the same class that I took from this guy, and you'll, you'll get it. Well, his passion and enthusiasm basically won me over. I came down to LA, I took the class, and I called John after class was over, and I was like, you're right. We're going to make this goddamn movie ourselves. We're going to do it.
first shot of this movie that we did was a night shot outside of the Kaiser Convention Center in Oakland. We had pulled together, to the best of our ability, the hippie and deadhead community. And we put a call out through all of our friends, through magazines, through newspapers saying, come and help us make this movie. It's got, it's got something to do with the, the dead lifestyle. Yeah. And uh, come help us. We need as many extras as possible. And when we got there the first night, we needed like 300 extras to pull off the scene. The first day, evening that we got there, I think probably 25 people showed right, up. Right, 25. Now keep in mind, on, on, a, uh, on a larger budget film set, the extras are hired, and they're union, and they're paid, and they're fed, et cetera, et cetera. 80 bucks an hour. 80 bucks an 80 hour? 80 bucks a day. I'm a sorry. day, yeah. yeah. And now I think the rate's up to about 100 and something. But in any case, um, we didn't have that. We were winging it by the seat of our pants. Um, we did have paid extras because it was a SAG film at some point, but we were given some leeway in that, so we really reached out to a lot of our friends. Right. But you, you really have to understand the gravity of having 25 extras show up in a scene where there's supposed to be hundreds of people. And you're spending, on our set, we're spending literally $20,000 a day. Yeah to move this picture for it. If we're a day late, that's $20,000 extra. Yes. And that's like what? That's 2% of our budget right, right there. Now, we should, we should um, I'm gonna quickly finish this story, then we're, we're gonna go back and talk about casting. Okay. Obviously very important. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we show up on the set at the Kaiser Convention Center in Oakland, where we've seen countless dead shows, and we're trying to recreate a dead show scene outside of the Kaiser. There are 25 extras, we needed 300. Total, complete panic in a way that I can't express to you. We basically, this is what we did. There, there was no other solution. We rounded up various members of our crew. We sent them all out in vans and cars of their own to Berkeley, where we essentially rounded up homeless people, literally, off the streets in Berkeley, California. We'd like roll up the street, there'd be some homeless people. We'd be Come like, in here. Get in the van, get in the van. Don't be afraid. Don't worry, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll give you lunch, we'll give you lunch, we'll pay you. Just get in the van, just get in the van. And we're grabbing groups of homeless people off the street in Berkeley, driving them to our set, taking care of them, feeding them, sending them over to wardrobe, slapping them with a tie-dye, getting them you know, all set for the shot. And it was a night shoot, so it began at six at night, and ended at six in the morning, and we pulled it off. We made it work. It was complete and total insanity. It it, it was the yeah. M word. It was yeah. It was a level it, of it was a level of stress that nobody should ever 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 have to experience. Name talent makes everything that much easier. And we were fortunate enough to work with Tara Reid, Devin Sawa, Eric Mabius, Bill Smitrovich, uh, Charlene Woodard, um, the list goes on and on. Um, Henry Lubati. Um, Coleman Domingo. Coleman Domingo, Domingo, John Piricello. I mean, just such incredible actors. Some of them had names. Charlene Woodard. Got her, got her ready. Got her ready. Some of them went on to become uh, much, much bigger stars than at the time when we saw them. But so we were very fortunate in choosing who we did. It helped our film to a great extent um, get the exposure that, 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 uh, that it did. Who, who was the LSD chemist? Uh, Stephen... Um, Tobolowski. Stephen Tobolowski. Yeah, he's, he's a real... He's uh, one of the funniest men on the planet. Yeah, amazing character actor. He yeah. plays the... Uh, I'm sure you've seen the film by now, watching us as kind of a, an afterthought. But um, yeah, he was uh, amazing as, as the LSD chemist, Doc. He was Doc. Yes. Yeah. So um, casting was an amazing process. Tara Reid was um, phenomenal when she came in to that casting reading. Um, I wasn't there, Tommy was there, but I heard reports about it. Apparently she owned the room and the character she the moment she hit the door. Like the moment the door opened, she was there. She completely nailed it. Um, she really did. She nailed it. She walked in, she knew 
who this character was, and she just did it. Right. And it was just awesome to see. It was just awesome to see. And uh, I pretty much, and I think the director too, we'd made up our mind at that point that she was going to be the person. How about Coleman? Talk Coleman about Domingo. Good God. Um, the tape, Uncanny. Tell me, I refresh my memory. Um, Coleman, uh, who plays the character Trace, which is based on uh, Mark Steve, who was a friend of Tommy and I's, um, who was an mm. absolute fixture on the Grateful Dead touring scene. A legend. During the uh, late 80s. A legend, really a legend. Late 80s and uh, early 90s. And uh, Coleman, who uh, is an African-American actor, when we saw him on tape, we knew that his, his physicality, his delivery, his, his spirit, really, that shone through on the camera, on the tape, not even film here. We knew this person should play Mark Steve. And we read uh, McKay Pfeiffer, who's now uh, becoming a really big star. He read for it, I Omar think. Omar Epps. Omar Epps read for it. Um, so Coleman really spoke to us. And Did we see Denzel Washington for that role? Denzel and Samuel Jackson? Yeah. Sam too? <laughs> no, no. Danny Sorry. Glover? We got to goof off a little bit here. Um, <laughs> we released the film in three cities. We sold approximately 40,000 copies of our DVD and our video. We got a, a deal on Showtime and Stars Encore on cable TV. We sold the film in probably now about 10 to 12 foreign territories. I used to get calls in the middle of the night every time our film was on Showtime again, or Stars Encore, and my friends would say, Jesus, your film's on again. I can't believe it. I had to watch it. It's so fantastic. Christ, you must be so rich. Long story short, Unipix Entertainment, a publicly traded American stock exchange company, mm -hmm. after selling 40,000 copies of our DVD and our video, after making deals with Showtime and Stars Encore, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, and to this day, never paid us a penny. No, um, that's the... Part of the sad thing about, well, not our, our, our own journey, but um, I mean, in terms of financial resources, uh, investors' money, personal monies, and I mean, a lot of, of our own resources, um, the majority of them, um, were invested in this labor of love. And uh, even though it's been shown and been seen, we're hoping that maybe someday we'll actually make some money. Yes. Um, just return some money. To investors or to us um, for what we've put into it and uh, that's what you're facing if you're thinking about making the film yes and this is a movie that is grossed you know over six hundred thousand dollars to date once again gross that's the key word <laughs> um, let me say a word yeah. on, on all of that Go ahead. financially speaking we took it up the keister <laughs> and there's just no two ways about it and um and this, all of this considering the fact that now millions of people have seen our film. And you're, you're, you're seeing it now on DVD. Yeah. Millions of people have seen our film now because it's been on cable you know, over 100 times. And um, it's, it's in video and DVD form all over the country and in foreign territories as well. We should appeal to them for money. Yeah. What? To send those money to us. Yeah. Um, so what we're saying is if you're watching this DVD... You should uh, consider sending us your money to help us. <laughs> a lot of it. Just write a check around the fire. Um, any size would do. Um, we've got a lot of ground to make up. And we'll put it to good use. I can assure you of that. Yeah. We will uh, um, begin to, uh, what, buy clothing again? <laughs> How about, do you remember, when's the last time you remember not being in debt? Of some kind of... You know, <laughs> dude, that's not even funny. I'm kidding. Um, but we're it, sorry. We're kidding. We're digressing. That was a stupid idea. Well, no. I think it's wise. I mean, you know. Well, we, if you we, want to send us money, we're certainly not going to turn it down. <laughs> There's yeah, that. 2701 2nd Avenue North, Seattle, 98109. <laughs> dude, that gets cut. <laughs> that's for damn sure. What? That's getting cut. No, it's not. Well, um, here's the story. Here's the story.
Is it all worth it? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I wouldn't trade this experience for anything, and I mean it. It's led to so many more opportunities in our lives. We're making new films now, new projects. Um, we're involved in the music side of things. We're involved in the film side of things, and it's awesome. And um, you, there's no education you can have in the world like actually doing something. Um, so what, go to film school if you need to and want to. By all means, a lot can be achieved there. But when you get out, make your movie. Whatever it is, make your damn movie, and you'll, you will learn what it's like to make a film. And, and if you're fortunate enough to get it distributed, that's a whole other ballgame. And if you're fortunate enough to make Penny One back, well, then you've really, you've really done something. And, and if you move people and you help them to understand themselves or to, to move forward in their lives in some way, well, then you're blessed, period. Yeah, it's a, it's a very uh, small circle of people who have the ability to work around uh, such talented and creative people and really influence culture and history, too. Um, and that's, uh, I mean, you know, if, if Around the Fire is nothing else, it was, a, or it is a film that was really accepted by a broad range of people that the story um, addresses. So in terms of us giving back to all the benefits that we had from growing up in and around um, music and hippie culture and drug culture and all the freedom and sorrow that that, that brought us in our own lives, um, we really, I think, created a historical document about a time and a, a journey of one person um, or maybe of two people, mm -hmm. you know, sure. who went through it. Yep. So uh, we, we hope that uh, you've enjoyed this commentary and that uh, you uh, maybe, you know, who knows, maybe learned something from it um, too and uh, had some good laughs. Yes, indeed.